I am Daisy Belki, your host for today, and it is really my great honor to welcome you all to this conference. If truth be told, it is in the midst of divergent life, the harmony that binds us all into one homogeneous whole. There is a strength that runs across and blends different groups into an entirety that is complete and whole. The beauty which is very basic of sustenance and of all diversity is often forgotten in the glaze of plunging too much into individuality and rationalism and in the popular jargon, us and them. As we gather here today, we discuss one of the most pressing issues of our time, harmony in diversity and the imperative of nurturing a compassionate world in the 21st century. We are reminded of the profound interconnectedness that defines our global community and to share the richness that is inherited in the seemingly diversification that surrounds us. Ladies and gentlemen, before we begin today's ceremony, we would like to invite our monks to join us on the stage for the special invocation. We are deeply grateful for the presence of our monks today and we kindly request them to lead us in a moment of reflection and prayer to set the tone for this morning proceedings. This prayer brings about the interrelated interconnection and compassion towards our day. Thank you. Thank you, Gila, for this beautiful invocation. Your presence brings a sense of peace and in mindfulness to our gathering. Thank you so much. <clears throat> now I would like to invite Mr. Saeed Iftikhar, the President of FISA and Federation of International Student Association, MISO, to deliver the welcoming speech. Please join me in giving a warm round of applause to Mr. Saeed. B.R. Ambedkar Research and Extension Center, Federation of International Students Association, Mesur, Voluntary Tibetan Advocacy Group. It gives me immense pleasure to extend my warm welcome to each and every one of you gathered, gathered here today. Be delighted to have you join us for a discussion meet on harmony and diversity. Today marks a significant moment for us as we come together, the event seeks to inspire individuals to recognize the beauty and strength and diversity and to actively contribute to creating more harmonious and compassionate world for present and future generation. Before we proceed further, I would like to express my gratitude to Honorable uh, Sink Young Pampa, uh, President, Central Tibetan Administration. Welcome you, sir. <laughs> Honorable uh, Professor N.K. Lakhna, Vice Chancellor of University of Mysore. Visiting Professor University of Mysore, 
Dear, dear unwavering support and dedication have been an instrumental is making this event possible. It's also my pleasure to welcome all participants today for this event. I would like all the guests and presenters from different countries who have gathered here to present their countries and their culture with us. In close, I encourage each of you full engage in today's proceedings to network with your fellow participants and to explore how we can collectively make a difference. Together, we have the power effect change and create a better tomorrow. Once again, welcome to this event. Thank you for your presence. Uh, and to welcome the syndicate, syndicate member and Mahesh and Nantraj, I'm sorry for that. Uh, welcome you all and thank you so much. Once again, welcome to the event. Thank you for your presence and uh, let's make today memorable and impactful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Syed for your inspiring words and for officially opening today's event. Your leadership and dedication to FISA M are truly incommendable. So now let's continue with the rest of our program filled with excitement and celebration. We have a special tradition that we would like to invite our honored guests to participate in. In a symbolic gesture of harmony and solidarity, we would like our dignitaries to join to floral tributes to the greatest teacher of the world, Bodhisattva Tathagata Buddha, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, and Dr. Ambedkar, The Adventure of Social Harmony. Thank you to our dignitaries for their participation in this beautiful tradition. Your presence and contribution make today's event truly special. So now as we commence the auspicious occasion, it is my distinct honor to invite Vice Chancellor Professor N.K. Lokna. He's a scientist Regan Spring AIDS Center, Harima Institute, Hokkyo, Japan. Postdoctoral fellow, Samsung Biomedical Research Institute, Suwon, South Korea. Research associate in Physics, University of Mysuru and PhD Department of Studies in Physics, University of Mysuru to deliver the inaugural address. And the Dias, Honorable Seeking Penpa, President, Central Tibetan Administration, Professor Anand, Director, International Central University of Mysore, and Professor J. Somshekar, Director, Ambedkar Research and Extension Center, Lahanan, Coordinator of VTAG, and Sayyid Iftika, and Professor R. Indira, Visiting Professor, 
of Ambedkar Chair and the, all the faculty members, syndicate members and coordinators of various organizations as well as teaching, non-teaching staff, students and media persons. It is a very memorable day in the University of Mysore as I am seeing the, the students from different countries are going together to understand the very important thing of harmony in diversity. So I just uh, thinking about that, in 1999 I first time visited South Korea as a scientist. At that time we have the same thing like this, a congress on foreign uh, people who are working in the particular in the Samsung company. So I am working for Samsung Biomedical Research Institute where we have around 500 Indians and other 300 from others, around 800, a very big number. We have a lot of uh, interactions. So then we become to know how the culture of each country is different, how this culture will change their ideas, their thoughts and other things. Similarly, here also I am extremely happy to take part in this discussion meet. The most important is the discussion meet, not the lecture. That's most important. Harmony in diversity, nurturing universal responsibility and compassionate world in the 21st century. People are giving definition for harmony in many ways. They are in their own way. But in my opinion, harmony defines. So harmony within the diversity, we living together peacefully, irrespective of race, culture and religions. So we are always looking at the people who want to live in peace. For this, our, uh, our elder people, you can I quote many people like this, you take Buddha, early and being, or Therese and Hushman, all are worrying about this, how we need to have to be in harmony in diversities. They are explaining many things that will be going to explain by probably Professor Anand or uh, the dignitaries on the dais of Honorable Sikh King <clears throat> Very important thing in our journey is so we come across every day there is a change. So that's the day of the hour. So the society cannot be say that stagnant. Society is growing. When society is growing, so this diversity also changes. Therefore, this harmony and diversity definitely encapsulates and a sense of fostering unity amidst our very backgrounds like cultures or beliefs and perspectives. You should think in harmony and diversity in a different way. In my opinion, you think about the opportunities for growth, learning and moreover collaboration. That's the most important thing. Whenever you have an interact with the foreigners, the first part is the interaction, or dialogue. Then the second part is the collaboration, where we can be able to extend, exchange our knowledge, or we can be able to enhance our intelligence or any other activities. Therefore, promoting harmony is very, very important in this society now, because it requires commitment to dialogue, empathy, and reconciliation. By fostering a culture of acceptance, we should accept the cultures of others and reconciliations, so and tolerance, we can build the bridges between the meaningful connections in the society. And also, it's an universal responsibility. That means every human being should be in harmony. But we have our own differences sometimes. So we need to sort out only through dialogues. So therefore, we need to understand that. So nurturing universal responsibility. This is my responsibility. This is your responsibility. This is his responsibility. We need to understand ourselves how our responsibilities has been taken up in this society. And the very important thing is we need to create a compassionate world that means live and let live. That's the most important thing. So that means it, this uh, compassionate should be it guides us to extend kindness empathy and support to others in their times of need. That's most important. If there is anyone who is having a problem, we should help them. So how can we help them? We need to do many ways we can help the people to improve their lifestyle. 
the individual empowered to alleviate suffering and promote social justice and then foster a culture of care and solidarity. That's the most important thing. So I remember always for this Gandhiji. Gandhiji once shared his views on Harman is, the way we reach to unity shows only beauty in diversity. Most important thing. So he has done. And you also know about Dr. Bear Ambedkar was conferred with the title of both Bodhisattva by the Buddhist monks at World Buddhist Council in 1954 at Kathmandu, a great humanitarian and architect of social harmony. He believed that freedom of mind is the proof of one's existence. That means we should have to develop an criteria or develop an idea how can we become a freedom of mind, the small thing. And also there are many people talking about Martin Luther King Jr. He has also given a lot of things. His dream is to a slave owner will be able to sit down together on the table as a brotherhood for rich people. That means all people are saying that's this idea. Similarly, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, a beacon of wisdom and compassion, emphasizes the importance of universal responsibility and compassion in shaping a harmonious world. We can say easily harmonious world, but in order to practice itself, it's a very difficult task. So that's where we do. So we have to be very practical in this uh, case of harmonious world. Uh, he advocates the, the holiness of the Dalai Lama, cultivation of inner peace and empathy as the foundation of fostering genuine harmony and addressing the challenges facing humanity. I really very much appreciated that the Dr. Ambedkar Center as well as the International Center make us this day a very important day where they can able to discuss the possibilities of this diversity in unity you need to think about. It. That means this young minds particularly who are studying in the post graduations or undergraduate students, they will be taking this task of say how to save the universe. That's the most important thing. And also I also know that Professor Anand will be able to shed light more on this uh, uh, how to improve their uh, relations with the other countries to these young minds, thereby they can debate themselves how we can survive in the universe as in brothers. And also, I also expected the Honorable President of Central Tibetan Administration, His Excellency Sikking Penpa, will definitely address the positive directions on this program. This type of program should help give certain inputs to our particularly foreign students and I am very happy that there are 20 countries students are today going to speak about this subject through their presentations uh, that will be the great strength of this program and, and I should also remember that our national poet Puvampu who was visualized the Vishwamanava concept that is world citizen should become more relevant to all of us today. So let us work together to build a strong, compassionate world which Buddha has taught long way back in 5th century BC. So as you already know, our country India is known for tolerance, coexistence, unity in diversity. I hope uh, today we will have a great uh, debate on these issues. I wish all the success for this program. I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your insightful and inspiring inaugural address. Your leadership and vision continue to guide us toward excellence and innovation. Thank you so much, sir. So now to present today's keynote address with such great eminence present among us, I would like to call upon Professor Anand in the conventional manner. However, I believe in embracing the unexpected and adding a touch of interest to our proceedings. Welcome, sir. Dignitaries on the Deras, Mr. Tsering, Lauren, Professor Lokanath, Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University of Mysore, 
Professor Somshekar, Director of this Center, Mr. Syed, the President of the Federation of International Students Association, University of Mysore, invitees, all the learned professors, beloved students from across the globe. For me, after having listened to the inaugural address by Professor Lokanath, it's a challenge. It is something uh, to search for words to speak in front of you on this excellent occasion. But don't consider this as a formal keynote address for a session that is going to have about more than 20 presentations from different representatives rather from different countries who are going to speak on their unique cultures and the need for integrating these cultures to nurture a compassionate, harmonious world. I'll take a couple of words from the title given for this discussion. At the first instance, it is to discuss on harmony in diversity. Harmony is the need of the art that is much talked about because it is the missing thing today. The reason is simple. Harmony is not just a piece of a situation of peacefulness. Peace is a temporary phenomena, a ceasefire, where we have settled our disputes temporarily to live for the day. But harmony is much, much bigger than that. Today, when you look at the world, when you watch any international media, anybody can feel that the world is burning because of the hatredness, jealous and attacks by the powerful on the weaker sections of the society. The war that's, that are happening between the different countries, the atrocities on the basis of religious, language, geographical basis, color, creed, nationality, these are the issues that makes us to think seriously about how to make an harmonious world where everybody can live comfortably, meaningfully, can lead their life as they wish. The moment I thought of talking something about harmonious relationships, you know, what flashed to my mind is and I, a quote from Dr. B. R. Ambedkar about democracy. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar said, in my opinion, democracy is not a mere form of governance. It is a mode of associative living. It is a conjoint of communicated experience and respect and relevance for the fellow human beings. Look at this. There are governments in the name of democracy. There are different forms of governments across the globe. But do we have a sense of associated living? A sense of communicated experience? A sense of respect and relevance to the fellow colleagues? If that's all there, there was no need of discussing so much on harmony. This is the missing link. And the objective of today's dialogue is to develop and nurture a compassionate world. As I understand, in simple words, to be compassionate means to feel together, to experience together, to understand 
understand the emotions, suffering, sentiments of others. There comes the importance of empathy. Without empathy, there cannot be compassion on the earth. Empathy is something that makes you to feel the sufferings of others around you. The insults, humiliations, exploitations that are faced by people like you. The moment you feel that the person who is sitting in front of me, the person who is talking to me is also like me, 50% of the world's problem is solved. But that's not happening today. That is not happening today. As I guess at this point of time, it is the conflict across the globe on issues that are not so relevant, that are making the world to burn. What could be the reasons for these conflicts? Needless to elaborate, it is all because of the grounds. It is all because of the growth. It is all because of the games. It is all because of the groups. It is all because of the glitches that the people do. I recall at this moment, wars are not fought between countries. Wars are fought between minds. These minds need to be tuned. These minds need to be addressed. Again, I recall Dr. B. R. Ambedkar who said once, cultivation of mind is the ultimate aim of human existence. Cultivation of mind is the ultimate aim of human existence. Harmony should originate first in your mind. Compassionate thinking should originate first in your mind. If you are internally compassionate, if you are internally harmonious, if you are internally caring for people, a dialogue will become naturally harmonious. Naturally harmonious. That can happen when we spread the feeling of love, belongingness, Caring, compassion. Again, I'm saying using the word compassion. Compassion means, again, thinking as the other person thinks, feeling for the pains of others across the globe. There are people who are suffering because of no fault of themselves. It could be on the basis of color. It could be on the basis of place of origin. It could be on the basis of the culture. Again, culture, you know. Culture is the unwritten constitution designed based on the situational forces. Situational forces have made people to develop their own culture since days immemorial. Today we have different cultures across, across the globe. I am happy to say that in India there is a greater diversity of culture. If you walk through the country there is a saying, at every 15 kilometers distance, you can find a difference in the culture, linguistic, living styles of Indians. Despite of that, there is a sort of unity in the country. The moment people use the word India, you know, we will forget all these differences in cultures. But I have to say that here, the world is made up of several countries with several nationalities, several faiths and beliefs, and it's quite natural that there will be differences in culture. No culture is superior, no culture is inferior. First of all, the, the concepts of superiority or inferiority are emotional. There is nothing like big or great, small in this world. They are all emotional. When you are emotional, try to be positively emotional. Try to be positively intelligent. There comes the question of emotional intelligence. Even if you are emotional, let there be intelligence in dealing with the people. How does it affect others? Whether my words hurt others? Culture, you know. I'm not going to elaborate. That in front of great scholars, madam, the great sociologists and all. When you speak about culture, you know, what, what it's all? It's all about the legends. It is all about the stories. It's all about the heroes. It is all about the power. It is all about the gender. These are the major things that are concerned with culture. How do we deal with this? Every person has a pride about his culture. Every person has a pride about his nation's stories and heroes. 
who are we to dispute it? We must not dispute. But we should learn to live in diversity. Diversity is the fertile land for creative thinking. Diversity is the fertile land for understanding each other. If there is something good from me, good in somebody, let me be generous to accept it. If something wrong that I have noticed on my own through an intercultural dialogue and conversation, let me forget it today. That's the beauty. Uh, Professor Lokanath made a mention about the dialogue. Intercultural dialogues will help us to understand our positive and negative aspects. When there is a positive thing, we must celebrate it. And when there is a negative thing, we must leave it there itself. That will lead towards a better world where people can care for each other. I am sure this discussion with the different uh, the nationality, different cultures will spread across the globe the message of belongingness, message of respecting others, message of practicing what is good for the mankind, what is good for the mankind. So that without taking much of your time, I'm really, really happy to be a part of this dialogue. And youngsters from different countries are going to make their presentations related to their cultural issues. Believe me, let it be the language, let it be the literature, let it be the art form, the dance, the song that you sing can be a means for uniting all of us. Let us make the world one, let us make the world to be a better place to live for the generations to come. Thank you all. Thank you. We live in the world of interdependence. Nothing exists in isolation. And the Buddhist concept of interdependence embedded deep in its approach towards understanding life and matter has revealed this many centuries ago. So what happens here affects there, and what goes on here impacts there. Such is what our lives are governed with our, but alas, we stand too remote and far afloat to the truth that stays with us every now and then. Thank you, Professor Anand, for your enlightening keynote address and your expertise and passion have truly inspired us. Thank you so much, sir. Let us now carry forward the momentum from Professor Anand's address as we continue with the rest of our program. So ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests and citizens of our beloved nation, it is with immense honor and gratitude that we gather here today for a momentous occasion. We have the distinct privilege of welcoming our leader whose dedication, vision and tireless commitment have shaped the course of our nation's history. In the presence of our esteemed Prime Minister, President, Mr. Bema Srin, we are reminded of the profound impact that leadership can have the fabric of our society. His unwavering resolve, compassion, and unwavering dedication to the welfare of our citizens serve as an inspiration to us all. Mr. Pimba Swing was born in 1967 at Balakupi, Tibetan Settlement, India. He was graduated with economics major from Madras Christian College, Chennai. He then worked as the executive director at the Tibetan Parliamentary and Research Center in New Delhi from 2001 to 2008. Since 1996, he was elected consecutively in 12, 13, 14, 15 Tibetan parliament in exile. In 2008, he was sworn in as a speaker of the 14th parliament and the 15th parliament in 2008 and in 2011, respectively. In July 2016, he was appointed as the representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in North America to the office of Tibet, Washington, D.C. He formally took charge on 29 August 2016. In 2021, he was elected as the Sikyong President Central Tibetan Administration and was sworn into on 27 May 2021. So with profound respect and gratitude, I invite you all to join me in extending the warmest of welcomes to our esteemed President, Mr. Pema Srinla. Thank you very much for the Nice introduction. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor, Mr. Loknath, uh, Dr. Anand, Dr. Somshaper here, and the Mr. Syed, the President of this International Students Association of Mysore University, for having me here. Uh, 
I was wondering what to talk about. I'm not an academician. I'm not a philosopher. Uh, I'm a practicing person. I'm more a pragmatic person who just does his job. Um, I was listening to Dr. Anand uh, telling uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor that whoever is the first speaker gets to cover the whole gamut of the topic. So the first two speakers have already covered most of the things that are related to today's topic, that is harmony and diversity. Uh, I would only, only like to mention two concepts. One is oneness of humanity. We are all human beings. We are all the same. Today, I might have a position as a political leader. Your vice chancellor might have a position as vice chancellor. But we are all human beings. We all have emotions. We are also we are all afflicted by negative emotions. We can, we also have the capacity to overcome these negative afflictions through positive thinking, and that is what I think Professor Anand was referring to when he referred to emotions and all that. So, when you talk about diversity, diversity can even extend to an individual. I keep saying we are eight billion people in this world. Now you won't find one person who is physically similar to you in the whole world. Uh, Tibetans have a saying, oh, there are nine similar people like you in this world, but I haven't found anybody who is exactly similar in physical feature. Right? Just as you have eight billion human bodies, physical differences, that many mental thinkings are also there. Not even a twin who are born together by, from the birth till they live together does not have the same mental thinking. So that speaks of diversity of human minds. And that is related to how, where you are born, how you were brought up, what was the kind of atmosphere that you grew in. That shapes your mind. So if you think about this concept of oneness of humanity and that every human being wants happiness, not suffering, then that concept itself will resolve so many differences. And the other thing the Master of Ceremony was mentioning often and often again is the interdependent nature of our existence. We must realize that we are our existence is interdependent on each other. So now it is proven more during the modern times when there are more conflicts around the world. Anything that happens in one part of the world impacts the other part of the world. We have very, as we speak, we are already witnessing Russia's war on Ukraine. We are already witnessing Israel Hamas issues. And when we came in, I met a lot of international students. I'm happy that uh, I'm speaking to all of you today because many of you come from conflict zones. And that is why I thought to bring more compassion and more understanding of each other is very, is, it was very important to understand one's background. Even Tibetan case, many of you might have heard about Tibet. And just yesterday, uh, in the last few days, I was speaking at Mount Carmel's uh, St. Joseph's University and uh, Ramaya College. From Ramaya University, I just came back from London, speaking at the Warwick Economic Summit, and had the opportunity to speak at major universities in UK, including Oxford, Westminster University in Abaddon, in UK, and many other universities around the world, apart from reaching out to governments to advocate for the cause of Tibet. But I am not very sure how many of you are informed about Tibet. Uh, one of my friends says that Tibet is more known for Momo and His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So beyond that, I'm sure you must be having a very fuzzy understanding or a very blurry image of Tibet. And I remember once uh, a Pakistani journalist asked me, which is bigger, Tibet or Bhutan? So that is the level of understanding of Tibetans or Tibetan. That's why I go to the basics to explain where we come from. So if you come understand the roots, backgrounds of every single nation, every single culture, every single religion that you're coming from, 
then you know when the other person speaks, they are speaking from that perspective and that you can be more compassionate and more understanding. You can be more open-minded, understanding their background. If you don't understand that background, then if you think only from your perspective as to how you perceive the world and how humanity should live together, then it's not enough. You don't have a holistic approach to your understanding. So therefore I thought maybe no, I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of speakers, there are a lot of experts to speak about this general topic on harmony and diversity. But if you understand the Tibetan case a little more, then you will have much more understanding of Tibet in your campus. Next time when you see another Tibetan, you would say, okay, I know about Tibet a little more than what I knew already before. So, I start with saying, uh, you know, the, the Tibetan history is also defined by its geography. Uh, we call us the, our land as the land surrounded by snow mountain ranges because we are surrounded by Himalayas in the south, Kunlun in the west, Karakoram in the north, and seas of mountain ranges in the east. That is why we call ourselves the heavenly abode, the land surrounded by snow mountain ranges. Unfortunately, we don't have PowerPoint presentation here, otherwise I, ha I do have, I always bring some uh, satellite image of where Tibet is located, it's in the heart of Asia. When you see the Tibetan plateau on the map, you will find that it's in the heart of Asia. And then many Westerners came to Tibet. We have a PowerPoint presentation. Huh? We have a PowerPoint presentation. It's okay, I think now the screen is also this call for. I don't know whether we have enough time or not. Maybe maybe I can just go on with uh, the, like this. So Tibet is located in the heart of Asia. Right. It's about 2.5 million square kilometers. It's 18 times the size of Japan, 10 times the size of the UK, the quarter of present-day China. So it's that big. Mm. Then Westerners started coming into Tibet from the late 16th century, the Jesuit missionaries and all that. Because Tibet used to be considered as the last frontier where Christianity could not penetrate. So, Please, please. So is the VC going, not the PowerPoint being played? Says one thing. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> then the foreigners call Tibet the roof of the world. Why roof of the world again? Because the average altitude of Tibet is about 12,000 feet above sea level, or 3,700 meters above sea level. The last time I was in Japan and speaking to Japanese students there, I asked them, which is your highest mountain? And that's the Mount Fuji. And how high? 3,700 meters above sea level. I said, that's like base camp in Tibet. You start climbing from there. That's how Tibet is. And because of that, the Chinese environmental scientists today call Tibet as the third pole because aside from North Pole and South Pole, Tibet has the largest amount of glaciers and permafrost that feeds all these major rivers in Asia, the perennial rivers. So if you know a little bit about geography, then you have the Yalu and the Yangtze flowing into Tibet. These two rivers originate from Tibet. These two are the lifelines of China. And Yellow River is also the cradle of Chinese civilization. If not for these two rivers, China won't be able to support 1.4 billion people in their country. Then you have the Mekong that originates from Tibet and flows into Laos, Burma, Cambodia, Thailand and Vietnam. Five countries in Southeast Asia. Mekong has become the lifeline of these countries. Aside from the Salween and Irrawaddy that flows into Burma. Then you have the Brahmaputra flowing from Western Tibet to Eastern Tibet, takes a U-turn to come into India. Now, the last time I was in Arunachal Pradesh, the Arunachal Pradesh Chief Minister was kind enough to send me in a helicopter to travel from one Tibetan settlement to another. And we were going over the Brahmaputra, and Brahmaputra was very muddy. The river was not in speed. There was no rain in Tibet those days. But people tell me that this has been going on since 2018, which means that there is a lot of work going up there. 
in the Tibetan plateau, where the big bend is. And we are of, uh, of, of the understanding that China is building a dam that's twice the size of three gorges, which is the biggest in the world. And the whole Himalayas is a seismic zone because it happened to, because of the tectonic shift between the Gondwanas and the Eurasian plate. And scientists even say that Himalaya is even growing today by 10 millimeters every year. So if something happens to that size of a dam in Tibet, you can imagine the consequences downstream, what's going to happen to Arunachal Pradesh, the whole of Assam and Bangladesh, they are all going to be washed away. Then you have rivers that come from Tibet, uh, like Karnali, that flows into Nepal and into India. Just when I was in Baltics last week, they had a satellite image of a huge dam that China had built on, on the, inside Tibet. And Nepal had no clue, India had no clue what was happening there. Then you also have uh, Indus and uh, Jhelum that originates from Tibet, goes into Pakistan and into, in, into India and into Pakistan. And Indus is the cradle of Indus Vedic civilization. So the rivers that originate from Tibet is home to two civilizations, two ancient civilizations of this world. And the countries that I'm talking about, from Pakistan to India, Nepal, Bangladesh, five countries in Southeast Asia, Laos, Burma, Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, and China, 10 countries receive their water from Tibet. And some say the Third World War could happen because of water. In that case, Tibet is a huge biospot, bio hotspot. And we are not just talking about climate change issues, but also about food security and water security for the region. Unfortunately, China does not share any hydrological data with any of its downstream riparian states. And they use Tibet's water like a water tap. And that's the reason why, because of Tibet's altitude, Tibet is also referred to as the water tower of Asia. So when there is excess, they let it flow, you have flood downstream. When there is shortage, then you have drought downstream. And people's livelihood are changing all the time. <clears throat> so this is just to give you an example of how significant is Tibet in terms of its geostrategic geo, uh, location, because Tibet was an independent country, and Tibet had remained a political buffer between the two most populous nations in the world, China and India, and there was never ever a border between India and China, till Communist China invaded Tibet in 1950, and when we were forced to sign the 17-point agreement in 1951. So according to international law, any agreement that's forced upon somebody else is null and void. So if it can be applied to Ukraine today, why not Tibet 70 years ago? It is the same international law. So that's why I keep going around countries. Uh, in the last two years, I've traveled to more than 24 different countries and have been advocating for this, that if you keep repeating the statement that Tibet is part of PRC, you're going against international law. And then I also tell countries that on the one hand you keep repeating the statement that Tibet is part of PRC and on the other hand they support negotiations with the representative of His Holiness Dalai Lama and the Chinese government. And these two don't go together. It contradicts each other because China rules Tibet with an iron hand. There is no political space whatsoever. If you have read George Orwell's 1984, that's more like George Orwell's 1984 coming into reality in the whole of China and more so in Tibet and other nationality regions in China. So, <clears throat> I will not dwell on the history of Tibet, only to say that now there have been uh, historical outputs by uh, learned professors, one of international law, and another Chinese professor referring to only imperial Chinese records. And that says that whether it's Tibet's Yuan relationship, which is Mongol, when Mongolia invaded Tibet. So it's Yuan in China, but Mongols were there even before and after that. And then the Mings, when China was ruled by Mings from 1368 to 1644, and the Qings from 1644 to 1911, comparatively, we had our own kingdom, we had our own rulers. 
Uh, and His Holiness the Fifth Dalai Lama took over in 1642, two years before the Qing's overthrew the Ming's in China. So what these two authors, one Chinese and uh, one another foreigner, who is an expert in international law, what they prove is whether it's Tibet Yuan relation, Tibet Ming relation, or Tibet Qing relation, or as per international law today, Tibet has never been considered part of China. So when we are talking about diversity, now His Holiness, uh, how many in diversity, His Holiness the Dalai Lama proposed a middle way policy, not seeking independence despite our status as an independent state um, historically. That is because he appreciates the common interests of humanity. He appreciates the concept of European Union. If it had not been for the concept of European Union, Europeans would still be fighting with each other and killing each other. If that can be applied to European Union, then why not Tibet with China? Because we lived with Chinese people for centuries, for centuries we lived in harmony with each other. But unfortunately, the present action of the communist Chinese leadership is bringing a lot of suffering for nationalities within China. <clears throat> so I also follow the middle way policy. We are committed to this, which means that we want to find a solution through non-violent means. Unfortunately, there is too much focus on violence. Wherever there is violence, media goes, political leaders goes, and that's more like you are promoting violence. Then people start wondering, the non-violent activists start wondering, what do we do to attract more attention from the international community? Do we take up violence? No, not at all. Violence is never a solution. As Mahatma Gandhi said, an eye for an eye will make the whole world blind. So is this something we want? We don't want the whole world to become blind. Violence begets more violence. Violence is never a solution to any conflict. The only way is through dialogue, through negotiation, through understanding. However, uh, intransigent the opposition is, or however intransigent the opponent is. We don't even like to call China enemy. We don't want to use that word. Because we take pity at the leadership. Sometimes I joke that if you have good hospitals here, we can bring Chinese leaders one by one, do brain surgery, put common sense in their head and send them back. <laughs> but that's all they need. We have addressed their main concern of sovereignty. Right? But they don't understand right now. The world seems to be functioning on whims and fancies of few individuals like Putin and Xi Jinping, unfortunately. So we have to focus on nonviolence as a means for conflict resolution, and that also I think resonates very well with, the, with today's topic. Of, uh, uh, but then I also want to let you know that we should understand these authorities that are spreading terror, that are spreading suffering in this world. And then, we, then only will we know how to counter them. So present day China is getting more paranoid. Xi Jinping is getting very, very paranoid. And he is going back to Mao's time. He is destroying all opposition in the name of anti-corruption. Of course there isn't anti-corruption. The latest data was that 110,000 people, 1,10,000 people were part of that anti-corruption move in 2023 alone. But Xi Jinping is hell-bent on destroying every other national identity by imposing Han nationality identity. When the whole world is moving towards multiculturalism, China is the only one that's moving towards uniculturalism. And that brings in more problems for the nationalities like Tibetans, where our language is being targeted. I just want to mention, because sometimes I get asked questions about since Tibet is now occupied by China, does Tibetan language have anything to do with Chinese language? Definitely not. The Tibetan language came from, the Tibetan script came from the <coughs> Gupta and Brahmi script from India. Even now, if I recite the Tibetan consonants, Kaka, Kanga, Cha Cha, Chanya, it's very similar to Hindi. 
our Buddhism also came from India. <coughs> so we are an extension of Tibetan, uh, of Indian culture. We transliterated every available Sanskrit and Pali texts into Tibetan from 8th to 13th century before Buddhism vanished from India. And today we are a repository of one part of ancient Indian wisdom because we must have had the biggest transliteration house in the world during those periods. And today we are in the process of translating back to Sanskrit. And we have a Tibetan dictionary just published about two years ago. And the volume of this dictionary, it has become, it has become the most voluminous dictionary in the world. 223 volumes of hard copy. And that's how important Tibetan language is. Tibetan language is one among the 15 most oldest languages in the world with more than 1,000 years of history. We have 76 families of languages in Tibet and some 305 spoken language. No other country has transliterated so much text from India. That is why we are proud to say that we are a repository of one part of ancient Indian wisdom that has the capacity to spread more peace and compassion in this violence-ridden world. Maybe I'll stop here. I think there are a lot of speakers after this. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I'll give you because some because you are, there are so many countries, students from Tanzania, Zambia, Nigeria, uh, everywhere, Afghanistan, Yemen, uh, many people from conflict zones. I just want to give you an understanding of how China functions. You need to understand China. I was in Mexico. I was in Colombia, I was in Brazil last month, last year, last year, October. They have no understanding of what China is doing. Similarly, Afri African leaders also have no understanding of what China is doing. Now there are some realizations because your entry into debt with China. Most of the African countries are restructuring their debt with China because they are not able to pay back the loans. You have to understand what is, hap what is happening, what China is doing to countries around the world. If you look from South, South China Sea where they are being very aggressive and belligerent towards the whole South China Sea countries from Taiwan to you know, Japan to Taiwan to Philippines to Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam, even India now is spending a lot of money on their defense. And all this is being exacerbated by China. Japan is spending more than what they are already doing. They were a Pacific state after World War II, and now they don't want to be any more pacifists. They want to be able to protect themselves from China's threat. So Japan is spending more. Taiwan has no choice. They have to spend more. Australia, for the first time, is spending $356 billion to buy seven nuclear submarines. To protect them against whom? From China. For New Zealand, security was never an issue. It is becoming one for the first time. <clears throat> you heard about the friction in the South China Sea between Philippines and Malaysia all the time, Mal Mal Philippines and China all the time. And then from the Malacca Straits, China has taken over part of Sihanouk Wheel port because Cambodia is not able to pay back China's loan. They are almost 40% in debt with China. Burma has already surrendered Cocoa Islands, where China can watch over the whole of Bay of Bengal, which is a huge security threat for India. Sri Lanka went bankrupt last year. They didn't even have money to buy papers for children's education at one time. And today, they built, China built the airport, China built the port. There's not much traffic, no income, they are not able to pay back the debt, and China has taken over Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. As we speak, we know about what's happening in Maldives. I believe Maldives Prime Minister is jumping from fire pan, frying pan, frying pan into a fire cauldron. He will know the impact of having a relation with China only when it's too late. And then you have China's relationship with Iran, China's relationship with Pakistan, there were some missiles being fired from Iran into Pakistan, 
to contain the anti-Iranian terrorist group. The Pakistan also fired back. China is the biggest bully, and they tried to play a peacemaker between the smaller bullies. And then China's diplomatic coup of getting Saudis and Iranians together, back with diplomatic relations. China's base in Djibouti, train link from Zambia to Tanzania. A whole lot of things are happening in the region. China has access to Red Sea through Greece. Italy became part of BRI, Belt and Road Initiative of China. Now they realized that it was not useful to them, so they backed out of it. Prime Minister Meloni, after coming to power. China has based in Portugal. Last time I was in Germany, they have acquired a part of Hamburg. So nothing comes for free from China. And when I speak with the Mexicans, of course, for, the, for them, the, their biggest trade, trade partner is trading partner is United States. And their second largest trading partner is China. And the Mexicans hate Americans so much because of immigration and border issues that their, their former foreign minister's nickname was China Boy. Yeah, so they don't realize, I keep telling them, I'm not here only to seek support for Tibet. I'm also here to warn your country and your people that if you're not careful, it'll be too late when you realize what China is doing to you. With some investments in Africa, in Latin America, they buy all the votes in the United Nations. At the latest Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council, of the UN Human Rights Council, just last month, there was a lot of coercion being used by China to ask countries to say what they want these countries to say because they invest money in those countries. But when you talk about investment, it's not just uh, money that's coming into it. It's just Chinese workers, Chinese engineers, Chinese equipment. Even trickle-down effect is not there. And so these, I think, need to be understood as to where China is going. Do you want an authoritarian regime in your country? Because China is now talking about global economic initiative, global uh, developmental initiative, which are almost the same thing, global security initiative, which also talks about the governance system that China is planning to export to other countries. And then China also talks about global civilizational initiative. So China has become very ambitious. It's not like during Deng's time when they say, hide your strength, bide your time. Now they are coming all out. They, their interference in the international community is so very much. It's so pervasive. And so I thought I'll just give you a background to all this and also make you understand that China is not as strong as you think it is. Someone told me, well, China is more, very monolithic and they can do whatever they want. Of course they can do whatever they want. They have a military power. The military power comes because of the economic power they have, because of all the businesses that uh, countries give them. And because of that, they have the political clout. But the only thing they don't have is the moral power. Nobody trusts them. And you might have known that in China, not more than three leaders above the rank of vice minister can meet together without the permission of the president. And you are talking about 1,000 people in that category, which means China is always afraid of its own coup. There's a lot of paranoia now. And I was telling one of our friends from Thailand, the deputy foreign minister of Thailand last time in Halifax International Security Forum in Canada, that China is not ready to attack you yet. And they asked me why. And I said Xi Jinping is moving all the generals from one place to another in a very short time. There is no time for the generals to create a good relation with the cadres. It's good for him to control, but it's not good to invade Taiwan, because you need synchronization of all those. You have heard about the purges of the commanders, we thought it's restricted only to rocket forces, which is a pet project of Xi Jinping. But now it has escalated beyond that. Not just Qingang, the former foreign minister, the missing foreign, 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 foreign minister, but also the missing defense minister, Li Shangfu, who was part of the procurement department. Three people were indicted. 
anti-corruption. Now it has extended to the Navy and the Army. So what does that say? That China is afraid of military coup. He makes sure that military is not synchronized enough to raise a coup. And then China is the only country that spends more money on internal security than external security. That itself manifests a deep distrust between the rulers and the ruled. And then people also ask me questions as to why China is being too belligerent on the Indian border. I've been from, you know, Tawang to, uh, from Arunachal Pradesh to Ladakh. Nothing grows in those mountains, not even a blade of grass, but they're still fighting over it. Then China's bellicosity towards Taiwan, Sankaku with Japan, Spratlys with Philippines, and a whole lot of South China Sea. And why do they keep these hotspots burning? My analysis is, depending on the severity of the threat to the survival of the Communist Party, they will attack one of these. If the threat is very severe, only then will they attack Taiwan. That is my understanding, my reading of the situation as to why China is keeping these hotspots burning. But right now, China is facing a lot of problems. According to latest statistics from the Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong market in the last three years, from 21 to 24, six trillion dollars worth of stock values have been wiped off the market. When we say six trillion, it is twice the size of UK's GDP. Six trillion dollars, not billion. That means six thousand billion dollars worth of stock values have been wiped off the stock market. China's house property, housing and property market is going down. That constitutes about 25 to 30 percent of China's GDP. Okay, I'll close here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bumasrinal. Thank you for your gracious presence and for your continued leadership. Your presence here today is a testament to the strength of our democracy and the promise of a brighter future for generations to come. Okay, so as we come to the end of the inaugural session, we have a special segment that is close to our hearts. Tomorrow marks the Tibetan New Year, a time of joy, reflection and renewal of many in our community. In the spirit of gratitude and thankfulness, we would like to express our appreciation to all those who have contributed to our journey and success. As a token of our gratitude, we have prepared a few small gifts to share with our honored guests. And so without uh, further ado, I kindly request the presence of our esteemed uh, Mr. Pema Srinath to kindly do the honor. Professor Somshekar, Director of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Research and Extension Center, Syed Iftikar, Vizdani, President of Pisa Ali. Iftikhar Vishdan, President of FISA. <laughs> we have prepared uh, a token of appreciation for Professor N. K. Loknath, Vice Chancellor, University of Mysore, as well as Professor G. Arman, Director of International Project, University of Mysore. As we conclude the facilitation and gift exchange segment, so as we conclude the facilitation and gift exchange segment, I would like to take a moment to express our gratitude to all who have made today's event possible. So it is with heartfelt appreciation that we extend our thanks to each and every one of you for gracing us with the presence and for your continued support. Your participation has made this event truly special. 
And now I have the pleasure of inviting Mr. Haru, coordinator of Voluntary Tibetan Advocacy Group and chairman of Global Cultural Society to the stage to deliver the word of thanks. Namaskara, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and tacitly to all of you. On behalf of the organizing committee, uh, comprised of the Dr. Vera Amberka Research Center and Extension uh, Center, and uh, also Federation of International Student Association, MISO, uh, and the Volunteer Tibet Advocacy Group, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you gracing us with your presence at this auspicious gathering. We are immensely grateful to Professor N.K. Lokanen, Vice Chancellor of the University of Mysore, for inaugurating this event and setting a tone of intellectual rigor and inclusivity. His words have inspired us to delve deeper in the essence of harmony and diversity. Our sincere appreciation goes to Professor Anandji, Director of International Center at the University of Mysore, for his enlightening keynote speech which has provided us with a valuable insight into fostering universal responsibility and compassion in the 21st century. We are deeply honored to have with us today Honorable Sikyong Pembatsri, the President of the Central Tibetan Administration, whose presence dignifies our discussion on such crucial matters. His leadership and wisdom are beacon of hope for all of us. A special thanks to Professor Indra, uh, uh, she will be chairing the session on the breaking cultural barriers and Professor J. Uh, Somishankar, Director of uh, Dr. Bira Ambedkar Research and Extension Center and Mr. Sai, the FISAM President for the in uh, valuable contribution to this course. We would like to express our gratitude to our esteemed partners, especially Global Culture Society, the Tibet House and the Mysore Tibet Student Associations and MTCC, whose collaborative efforts made this even possible. To the college principals, syndicate members, chief representative, uh, the dedicated staff of CTA, and students, and our esteemed guests, your presence here today signifies your commitment to promoting harmony and understanding among diverse communities. We extend our thanks to press, the police and the students for their support and cooperation throughout the event. In conclusion, let us carry forward the spirit of this discussion meet as we continue to work towards building a more harmonious and compassionate world in the 21st century. Each of us learn to work on not just for his or her own self, family or nation, but for the benefit of all mankind. Universal responsibility is the key to many survival. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Haroha, and this came to an end of our inaugural session. And we have 15 minutes tea break. After that, we have session on breaking cultural barriers, presentation by 20 international student speakers from over 20 countries. And we will have a group photo outside after the session, so everyone is requested to gather outside, please. <laughs> to address the session, please, madam. Yes.
Hey, namaste to all of you. Uh, since that's okay, I'm not a person who stands on formalities, but I would like to tell you a few things. First, uh, I thought that I'm a I'm visiting professor at the B.R. Ambedkar Chair. That is my identity at the center. But I also would like to tell you that I have had the longest stint as director of International Center of this university for 10 years. And this Federation of International Student Associations was started by me. Because they were country associations. But as I mean, I usually don't speak of myself or what I did, but I think you should know because I thought, you know, in the introduction process, somebody was talking about this, so I thought, let me tell you, because from the morning, uh, President spoke about it, the Vice Chancellor spoke about it, the Director, uh, my colleague, whom I, uh, Dr. Anand, I have known him since his student days, uh, spoke about it, I'm telling you, we, we are speaking about the need to know each other's cultures and countries. So after starting FISA, I had also initiated a program called Know Your Country. And every week or every fortnight as the case may be. We used to have, you know, students from one country uh, talk about their country, present a video, and then we used to have discussions. I'm not sure whether the program is still on now. Uh, I wish Dr. Anand was here, but then you surely can take it on to him and reintroduce that program. So, without much ado, because time is very precious, uh, I don't have a list of the presentations which normally a person who chairs uh, should have. And I'm here as Professor of the Ambedkar Chair at the Ambedkar Institute. Okay? But we are in uh, center. I know FISA is part of the International Center, right? Yes. Uh, of the University of Mysore, right? So you should say that. And, well, you know, FISA was part of all our programs when we organized. Uh, anyway, wishing you all the best. How many present? I heard there are 20 presentations. And what is the end point? You should tell me. This is a half a day's program, right? Yes, yes. Huh. Uh, so, even I, I'm sorry, but then I don't think we can go, each presentation can go on for more than 10 minutes. It's so, about first eight seven minutes? minutes. Seven, or, seven, huh? seven minutes. Seven. seven. Okay. Yes. Well, I think I was being more liberal. Okay, seven plus one. Plus one. <laughs> and so please just introduce yourself, your country, and come directly to the topic. Because I wish I had. Do you have a list of the presentations? Yes, yes. Yeah, list. Okay, let's start. Okay. And please take over and. Everything Everyone silent. Seven minutes <laughs> and it stops. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Dignitaries and the dais, and as well as the friend, uh, friend Bint, the director of uh, Ambedkar Research Center, and also the visiting professor, the president of uh, FISAI, and distinguished uh, guests and faculty members, friends and colleagues. Uh, I am Subhatullah Amini, 
I'm from Afghanistan, and today I'm here to present, and actually today I'm here to introduce you to the beautiful country, uh, Afghanistan. So this is Afghanistan, which is uh, uh, consists of 34 provinces. Uh, with the central uh, city Kabul and with the, three, uh, with the national flag of three colors, different ethnic groups, with a total uh, over 34 million population. Uh, you might have known about uh, uh, Afghanistan, or uh, you might have uh, heard lots about Afghanistan through social media or uh, uh, newspapers, TVs that they were reflecting all negativity about Afghanistan. Maybe you have heard that Afghanistan is the, the country of war, country of drugs, or so and so, whatever the negative points uh, being shared by the social media. But you might have not understand the beauty of this country, that how beautiful this country is. So let's have a look on that. And look at how beautiful this country looks. Uh, you know, as previously in the, the previous sessions, uh, dignitaries uh, pointed this and gave a hint that today war in the world is not war between the countries, and it is war of minds. And this is how people start war with Afghanistan, you know? Why they, they start war uh, to Afghanistan between the minds? So because they can give negative ideas toward this country. And you know, who will be targeted all the times? Whenever your country, yourself is always being targeted, you have to know that you have some valuable things. If, you have, uh, if I give you an example, uh, consider one a rich person, you, you, you might have seen lots of rich people that uh, they have bodyguards around themselves. Why? They are not bad people. They are not bad people. But why they are keeping bodyguards with themselves? To just protect themselves because they can be targeted anytime. Because they are valuable, they have something important with themselves. That is why the country which are uh, targeted always, they have something important. So the Afghanistan is a rich country. We have the biggest gold, lithium and copper resources on, on the earth. So this is uh, Mr. Alnak, which called the biggest uh, uh, copper source on the earth. We have a contract for the extraction with China. Uh, and also we have the lithium resources in Ghazni province of Afghanistan, which is the biggest lithium resources of the earth, which can be used in electronic batteries. Uh, and also the second gem of our country, I can call it the dry fruit. Uh, we have a, a big uh, business uh, around the uh, globe uh, uh, to export our dry fruits. Uh, the, the natural and delicious dry fruits you can find in Afghanistan. Uh, we have the max uh, business with India, uh, the explosion of uh, dry fruits. So apart from all these things, we have a national dance uh, which is called Athana Milli. So and this, uh, yeah, this one. Yeah, and the second one is called Karsak. So as you can see, maybe uh, international students are familiar with this kind of dance and other cultural programs we have shown this uh, dance event channel. Uh, as you can see here in the video, this both the dances are like a player, it is like a team player. People are gathering and they are celebrating their happiness which show the real brotherhood and they can take part and they feel like that we are together to celebrate the happiness. So, in the last, I just want to show the delicious foods of Afghanistan. This is the famous and delicious foods of Afghanistan. In the first column, you can see all the rice items. And the second, all of the bar uh, barbecue and kebabs. 
And the last, it is fast dry foods. We call it is like a vegetable, a mixed vegetable uh, parotta and aloo parotta, and also we uh, we use mantu. It is like a momo. As uh, Mr. President of Tibet uh, said that uh, Tibet is famous for the momo. Uh, Afghanistan is also famous for it is uh, mantu. So I hope that everybody uh, go to Afghanistan, visit and enjoy this delicious food and people of Afghanistan are not really bad, they are so friendly and so hospital. So once uh, you go there, you will see uh, the situation, the behavior of the people and hope you visit Afghanistan and enjoy all these delicious foods. So as the time is so limited, uh, I don't want to take longer time. They told me that more than 20 countries are here to represent their country. Uh, I will uh, say thank you to everyone for uh, giving me this opportunity to come and represent the country. Thank you so much. call upon uh, Nigeria representative to come and uh, present the presentation. to all of you. My name is Emmanuel Jenna Joseph and I'm from Nigeria and I will be representing my country today by giving you guys history and um, some facts about cultural heritage that most of you doesn't really know. So um, please, yeah. So the content of our discussion today will be the introduction, overview, the geography, the economy and uh, political cultural diversity and tourism attraction, and we're going to go to the conclusion. Please, next slide. Okay, so um, for most of you who doesn't really know, uh, Nigeria, officially known as the Federal Republic of Nigeria, with total area of 923,768 kilometers and 356 to uh, 670, 67 square meters. And Nigeria is vibrant and diverse country located in the West Africa. Actually, most of you guys don't really know, like when they see me, they'll be like, where are you from? Africa? Africa is not a country, okay? It's a continent. And Nigeria is located at the Western part of um, Africa. And um, it is the most populous country and nation in Africa with over 200 million people and it's known for its rich um, cultural heritage and natural resources and economic potential. The Nigerian capital is Abuja, uh, where I'm from, and which is the federal capital territory uh, and it was decreed in 1976. Lagos, the former capital, uh, capital, retains its standing as the country's leading commercial and industrial city. So um, Lagos is um, the former, you know, capital of the country, and um, Lagos is like it's a state in Nigeria, and um, it is it is uh, it has a lot of population, like 200 and something million people there, um, there in Lagos State. And uh, Lagos is also known for um, a lot of uh, population all over Nigeria, north, south, east, west, and all. So next slide. Yes, um, the country became independent on October 1st, 1960, 
which makes it National Independence Day of Nigeria, which we celebrate. And uh, in 1963, adopted the Republican Constitution. And uh, Nigeria has 36 states with 774 local government administration office. And um, the main indigenous languages which we speak in Nigeria is Hausa, Igbo, and Yoruba. And um, the official language is English, but we still use um, the indigenous languages to speak to ourselves. And we have a famous language which is known in Africa as um, the Pidgin language. You know, it's a form of English, but in another way, we created that for ourselves. You know, just to talk in case, you know, when a foreigner is around, we could just relate to each other. So, um, the main religions are Christianity, Islam, and traditional religions are practiced in Nigeria. So, geographically, Nigeria shares borders with several countries, including um, Benin to the west, Niger to the east, and Chad, and Cameroon to the south, and by the Gulf of Guinea of the Atlantic Ocean. It has a diverse landscape encompassing coastal plants, savannas, tropical rainforests, and plutus. Plutus in, this, in the central region and in the northern region, characterized by the Sahel and semi-arid conditions. The Niger River, River Niger, is one of the Africa's longest rivers, and River Niger is in Nigeria, so it is um, said to be one of the longest um, rivers in Africa. So uh, this is just like a review here uh, on the map. So you have Nigeria and you have Cameroon, uh, which is um, you know, the neighboring countries, Gabon, Congo, Chad, Niger, uh, Benin, and other um, countries around Nigeria. So the economy of Nigeria. Nigeria has one of the largest economies in Africa, um, driven primarily by its oil and gas industry and also practice a mixed economy. So Nigeria is the, is the largest natural gas reserves, okay, they have the natural gas reserves, and second largest oil reserves in Africa. It is also a major player in sectors as agriculture, uh, telecommunications, banking, and entertainment. Nigeria to further diversify and strengthen all the sectors like manufacturing, financial services, tourism and technology enabled services. So the main markets for Nigerian exports, which we export goods to, we have uh, consisting mostly of crude oil, because we produce um, crude oil a lot in Nigeria. And um, you know we, we share with cocoa beans and rubber. So we also export goods here in India, and um, the United States um, and the European Union. And um, now let's go to the political aspect. Nigeria is the Federal Republic modeled after uh, the United States. So we were colonized by the United States uh, with executive power uh, exercised by the president and legislative power held by the government and two chambers of the National Assembly. Uh, it has 36 states, like I said, and the federal capital territory. Uh, there are over 500 different ethnic groups, over 500 different ethnic groups, who mainly live together harmoniously, but there have been some tensions and conflicts. You know, when you have a lot of population in one country, you tend to have um, some little conflicts and stuff like that. So we have two tiers of government, which is the local and, um, you know, and the rest. So Nigeria is home to over 250 ethnic groups, uh, which with its own distinct languages and traditions. So the ethnic groups in Nigeria have their own languages and uh, they have their own traditions and customs. And Nigeria is often referred to as the giant of Africa because we are the most populous country in the world. So uh, we have three major ethnic groups here. You can see Hausa, Fulani, Yoruba, Igbo, and the rest and the rest. So please. So now here we have um, the traditional attire, which is being worn by Nigerians. As, and as you can see, I'm actually wearing one right now. And um, we wear this in Nigeria for like cultural events and stuff. So you can see there, yeah, this is like um, a wedding, you know, a traditional wedding. Like you can wear this in Nigeria. 
and it's always beautiful to see. So tourism and attraction, we have so many tourist um, attractions in Nigeria where you find a lot of um, Americans and Indians also, um, they always come to like view and see the beauty of Nigeria once in a while. So um, please next slide. Yes, so we have here, we have festivals that are hosted in Nigeria and it's one of the biggest, you know, uh, festivals which is held in Nigeria. We have a lot, a lot of um, foreigners who literally visit for this event. So we have, um, yeah, Nahli is Nigerian food. Uh, very wonderful. Uh, we have uh, some foods from the east, some foods from the west, some, some foods from the north. We have Yoruba foods, we have uh, the jollof rice, which is known in Africa. You know, some African countries usually drag with us that we don't have the best jollof, but I tell you, I, we have the best jollof. Okay, so we have um, the Zuma Rock. These are just tourist attractions. Um, in Nigeria, we have Zuma Rock, we have some in Lagos and all. We have nice places in Nigeria. So next slide, please. Yes, here again we have you know a lot of um, you know tourist attractions, you know nature, just to go sit and you know just enjoy yourself. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, so I know most of you guys know him, Brahma, the one who sang "Baby, Calm Down." Actually, he's from my country. My he's from my country. For you guys that doesn't really know, because you know most of you guys are like, "Where is he from? Where is he from?" So, Actually, he is from my country. You and, have to uh, put it the background a little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, he's from my country, and uh, we have David O2, you know, in the entertainment. This is just all about entertainment, and uh, yeah. We've gotten a lot of Grammys from the United States and all. So in conclusion, yeah, Nigeria is a country of immense potential and challenges with its large population, you know, abundant um, natural resources and cultural diversity. Nigeria has the capacity to become one of the major economic powerhouse in Africa. However, the country faces significant hurdles. Despite these challenges, Nigeria has made strides in various sectors including telecommunications, entertainment, agriculture, entrepreneurial spirit of its people, coupled with the growing tech innovation scene, presents opportunity for economic diversification growth, efforts to improve governance, enhance transparency and tackle corruption are the crucial for unlocking Nigeria's full potential. So on behalf of me and my beautiful country, Nigeria, I want to really give a big uh, thanks to the President of FISA M for giving me this opportunity to advertise and tell you more about my country. Thank you very much. Thanks for your nice presentation. Uh, next, I'd like to call upon Tajikistan uh, presentation to come and present. I'm from Tajikistan. I will represent my country, Tajikistan. So this is a flag of Tajikistan, and Tajikistan it is officially the Republic of Tajikistan. It is a country which is landlocked and which is situated in the heart of Central Asia. And the capital of Tajikistan is Dushanbe. So this is the uh, capital of Dushan, uh, Tajikistan, Dushanbe, one of the biggest city in Tajikistan. And Tajikistan is bordered with the four neighboring country, which are Afghanistan from the south, Uzbekistan from west, and Kyrgyzstan from north, and China from the east. So total area of Tajikistan is 143 square kilometers. So what does Tajikistan mean? Everyone is asking. Tajikistan, the Tajikistanis came from Persian language, which means land. It is the land of Tajik, or let's say Tajik land. So Tajikistan is uh, consists of four administrative countries. These are Seoul, Khatlon, Badakhshan, and uh, Khujand. Yeah. These are four administrative countries. 
and each region is divided into several districts and subdivided into villages. The population of the Tajikistan it is almost 10 million, and the currency is Somali. Uh, official language in uh, Tajikistan it is Tajik language. So Tajik, the main ethnic group, although there is a sizable minority of Uzbek, Kyrgyz, and a small population of Russian. So during the Soviet Union, as my country was part of the Soviet Union, since 1929, uh, the official language in my country was, uh, first it was Tajik, and the second lang uh, language, official language, was Russian. Tajikistan has a high rate of illiteracy. Uh, with an estimated 98% of the population having the ability to read and write. So these are the biggest universities in my country. This is University of Central Asia, which is located in Badakhshan, in Pamir. This is the Russian Tajik Slavonic University, which is in a city in Dushanbe. This is the medical university, uh, which is also lo uh, located in the city in Dushanbe. Almost 300 or more than 300 students, especially from India, is uh, studying at this university, medical university. This is a national uh, uh, university, Tajik National University. Um, most of the population are Muslims, and majority are Sunni, and a small percentage of uh, um, population is Shia Ismaili Muslim. Tajikistan was part of the Soviet Union from 19 to 1929 till the breakup and became independent in 1991 and experienced a civil war between political region and religious tension from 1992 to 1997 and um, which was the negative impact in the economy of Tajikistan. Almost all the industrial factors have been destroyed by the civil war. And the head of the country is President Umumali Rahman. This is the head of uh, my country. Uh, he came to power in 1992, especially during the civil war here, and was first elected uh, president in 1994. He three times uh, uh, won the election and became uh, president of my country. So coming to economy of the um, Tajikistan, Tajikistan has strong economic growth and record low inflation in 2023. The main export of Tajikistan is aluminum and cotton. Almost 75% is export. And the third uh, important export is electricity. The main export uh, partner are China, Turkey, Russia, Iran, and Afghanistan. Tajikistan climate is, is continental, subtropical. And in summer, the temperature is uh, 30. Uh, and in winter time it can be minus uh, 18 and even minus 20 if it's too cold. Some of the highest mountain also uh, uh, including the uh, Pamir and Alai also in Tajikistan. Also the principal rival of Central Asia also uh, Amudarya and Sidarya is also in Tajikistan. Uh, another famous thing about Tajikistan it is Pamir Highway which is the second highest uh, road in the world. It is also in Tajikistan. <coughs> So this is the cuisine of uh, national dish of uh, my country. This is a palau. I think you all know palau, but unfortunately it is not spicy in my country. <laughs> so this is a mantu. Uh, mantu is also our national dish, uh, also of Afghanistan, yes. but it's not uh, look like as momos. It is a bigger than <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not. Gradients also different. Yeah, yeah, right. So this is a korotop, this is a uh, sambusa, we call this one. This is a short pop. This is a traditional dancer of my country. We call uh, and traditional clothes of my country. Uh, we call it, this one is toki in, in my own language and uh, national earring of my country. And this one is called uh, traditional dress. Familia. This is also traditional. So now I want you, uh, your attention to a small uh, video short about the beauty of my country. Tajikistan, the land of peace and friendship.
become uh, with the allies and this the sweet and the Palestine in uh, traditional food is uh, kapsa magluba this rice with the chicken biryani <laughs> this uh, traditional clothes of Palestine this address of women and this address of women now the area of at least a part of it it's always known as the holy land and is held sacred um, among Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. Finally, I will tell you, despite the challenge, the people of Palestine continue hope for a better future. They hope for a day when they will have their own independent state where they can live in peace and security. Now, I will see you two video, the first video, uh, into uh, traditional uh, food, and the second video is the city of the Palestine. Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. This Gaza city. This Ariha. This is the West Bank of Palestine. This Haifa. This is the West Bank of the Palestine, and this Atka, this is the West Bank of Palestine. Okay, the second video of the traditional food of Palestine. Yeah. This is the traditional clothes of Palestine. I think it's not a lot in the This is the holy point, this is the famous of Pakistan. Finally, uh, this is the best by Muhammad Hassan. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your watching and watching Habibi. See you in Palestine. Bye bye. Uh, next, uh, I, uh, I would like to call upon uh, Sudan representative to present uh, his presentation. Thank you. And after that, free free Palestine. pursuing a master's degree in environmental science, Mysore University, coming from a beautiful, precious, and benevolent country known as Sudan, that I'm about to talk about within the next few minutes. So with no further, with no further delay, let's get to it. Our beloved country, which is known as Sudan. The, the name Sudan is derived from the Arabic word, which means the land of the blood, with reference to the blood or to the blood or to the dark skins of the inhabitants of that country. The country is located in the northeast Africa, bordered or linked to eight countries: Egypt to the north. Red Sea, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. To the east, Central Republic Africa, or of Africa. To the west, or to the southwest, Chad. To the west, Libya. To the northwest, the country has an area of about one million eight hundred 
86,000 square kilometer, which makes it the third largest country in Africa and the first largest country, or the first largest country in Africa before the separation of South Sudan on 9th July 2011. That took 25% of uh, the total total area of Sudan with 900 meter coastline and <clears throat> the capital city of Sudan is Khartoum which located in the heart of Sudan at the conjunction of the White Nile and the Blue Nile of the River Nile, the longest river in the whole lake, as well as it occupies the larger part of the River Nile uh, in Sudan. So, <clears throat> the situation of Sudan, it was on 9th July on 2011. So coming into the history of Sudan, Sudan actually is rich in, in history. So in the northern side, the human civilization is started in the, with the Nubian Kingdom, or the Nubian Kingdom in the north uh, Sudan. That has written the most ancient history in the human beings, uh, almost about 2,500 to 3,200 3, years ago, before the Christ, followed by Marawi, and Nepta civilization. So the largest occupation was the English Egyptian occupation, which ended in 1956 when we got our independence from the British Egyptian colonization. Sudan is inhabited with 49 or 48 to 49 million, with more than 500 race or tribes with more than 500 race, with 140 languages. So the official language for Sudan is the Arabic language, and the English is the, the second widely used uh, language. Along with that, 140 languages of the other tribes. Arabs are the majority of Sudan, then come the indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, African of Sudan. The religion, when it comes to the religion, as for the religion, Islam is the uh, the, the most uh, the, the popular or the the, 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 the first religion uh, in the country with a percentage of uh, ninety seven percent. Coming into the culture, actually Sudan has uh, like a special social life flourished with dance, music, and songs that is like practiced mainly in the ceremonies or certain ceremonies of marriage, harvesting seasons, uh, while combating or confronting uh, national crisis or any crisis. So we, this, this kind of, uh, of, of practice will be practiced there. And this is our national dress, just the heritage and the insight uh, and the scenic beauty of, uh, of Sudan, which was your eyes actually towards in the real life. Moving into the tourism, actually Sudan is rich in terms of uh, uh, national landscapes. So all of these are you know, the national, uh, national beauty or landscapes. So it has advantage of several sightseeing like mountains, forests, wildlife, animals, uh, and uh, the National Museum, the archaeological site, and waterfalls which are located in the western, western side of Sudan. So this is the western part of, of Sudan, which is called Darfur, before the occupation of, because the, before the English occupation, it was a separate kingdom known as uh, Darfur Sultanate, and especially the area is a series of mountains called Marra Mountain or Jabal Marra, uh, which has the highest, highest point in Sudan, or highest elevation, with about 3,000, 3,200, 3,042 meters, uh, kilometer or meters above the sea level. This kind of force, actually, most of them, uh, like are national, for the indigenous people, is something like normal. Even me, when I was there before I came to the India, I used just to come here to, to have a bath because our life is just simple. I just come here to have a bath or wash my clothing. It's so simple for us. So the economic 
basically, or basically, is based on the agriculture, and then on the gold mining, oil production, livestock, and the industries. So, please move. So, this is our different protections of agriculture, uh, the different agricultural protections from the fruits, vegetable, vegetables, uh, coming into the uh, legume, cereal crops, and we have the east, also cash crops. The Sudan is the largest gum arabic producer in the world. This is the cash crops like the groundnut, sea simpson, uh, uh, maize, sunflower, and other cash crops. The livestock, the availability of large national cultures, and the seasonal rains in Savannah create an optimal environment for, uh, for the livestock that produce milk and meat for the domestic consumption. As Sudan is a very large area, it's the third, as I said, it's the third largest country in Africa. <coughs> so now I'll let you enjoy the, uh, just a small video of Sudan with one of the national songs of Sudan. <laughs> Our life is so simple actually. The origin of civilization. The white island, the conjunction of the white island, blue island of the, of the river island, the longest river in the world. From the African tradition. You have been an amazing Ashley audience. Thank you for your Thanks for a nice presentation. I'd like to call upon a uh, Yemen representative to present the presentation. consists of three colors. The first color which is red, that represents of freedom. The second color which is white, that represents of pace. And the last color which is black, that represents darkness. So could you walk? So the background of my country, Yemen, is really simple. So that I'm going to express it as short as possible for you all. So please lend me your attention and focus, please. So uh, the country name is the Republic of Yemen. Uh, the location, it is uh, in the south of Arab Peninsula, which is Asia, in the Middle East. Between, if you know, do know about it, it's between Saudi Arabia and Oman. So, the capital city of my country, it is Sana, which is my original city that I was born inside. Uh, the area of Yemen is 555,000 square kilometers. The population is above 34 million of people. Uh, the president of my country name, so that he is, uh, there are seven presidents, but this one is you know, the head of them, which is, uh, who is Rashad al Uh The religion is absolutely Islam. There is no another religion in my country. Uh, the nickname, of my country, it is the happy land. So, when you go to visit my country, you will see that all the people are smiling and they are so happy for what, and welcoming you warmly. Uh, 
famous for, it is famous for the ancient architecture, so that you will find an old century buildings in my country. Uh, it's rich for oil, rich for gas, petrol, bakur, and many, many things. So, now here, if you're going to try to you know, travel my country, so that you would face everything incredible inside. And you would find a lot of kind people inside that welcome you warmly, and you're going to interest inside. So, next. So, those are major facts of my country, Emma. The first fact it is the Eurasian of Arab. What is the meaning? The meaning here is that the language Arabic, Arabic language, is, comes from my country and separated to follow different countries. So, the next thing is Mocha. Mocha, this is kind of coffee if you know it. The original name of Mocha is, comes from my country. So, the third thing is, you know, most of my country is, you know, desert. So that's why, you know, it's rich of oil and petrol. Next. Uh, Yemen has many, many beautiful islands. And one of the most beautiful islands in my country is called Sogadra. Sogadra that have many rare animals, many rare, you know, uh, plants and trees, many rare things. So, could you back this? The first tree is called, you know, the dragon blood, which is going to be like that brother's blood. This tree is rarely, you will not, you will not find it any place in the Valongoro world except that island. So, also the last picture, which is like a cat, it is the bad cat. From this cat, there is a small box inside it that we take it and make from it perfume and creams. From this cream is going to smell very nicely. So, next. So, Yemen is the home to some uh, of the world's most spectacular UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Such as, you know, look, this is, you know, that. Yemen Gate. What do you mean about Yemen Gate? There is our Babel Yemen, we call it in our country. So, there is, this is a small, you know, area or city that you cannot enter a city from any place except this gate. And those are the, you know, pictures that is inside the gate. This is Old Sana, and this is also called, you know, the uh, Balas of Old Sana. The third is uh, Dar al-Hajar. And the last one is a representative of Manara, that means uh, related to a mosque, masjid. Next. So those are also, you know, uh, the first picture is like a small big pen, which, you know, Britain was occupied by country, so that they, you know, bought their touch as, you know, the building that you say as a tower. Uh, the next picture is like a throne. It was the throne of Queen Belgis, Belgis Queen. Which that throne that she sat inside and she controlled, you know, that, that nation. So, rich of traditional clothes and customs. When you visit my country, in each city, you will see diversity of many kind of clothes, many kind of food, many kind of accents. Even in our Arabic language, we speak Arabic, but when you visit my country, you will find different kind of accents. Yeah, that's true. And this is the next, you know, side of uh, wearing. This is for uh, Al Mahara wearing, and that's for also for Al Mahara. That's the traditional uh, dress for uh, Al Hudaida. And next, please. Those also are represented such kind of, you know, cities in my country. So now it's you know the, the most beautiful part that you're going you know, to listen. But please watch carefully. And just going, you know, to interest about what I'm going to give to present you here. So please play it, and you will listen to you know, the music also.
I'm sorry, I have one video. It is not, you know, a minute. It's have a minute. It is represented as a music, which is about my country music that is traditionally from Sana City. And also there is connected with such kind of, you know, clothes. Okay. Traditional dress. Dresses. Could you play it?
So our national language is Swahili. I'm sure uh, most of you are a little familiar with it. As uh, the words in Swahili are incorporated in, in Bantu languages and also Arabic. And also, like, if you have watched some movies like The Lion King, there is some Swahili words there, like Hakuna Matata, which means no worries. <laughs> yes, Hakuna Matata. <laughs> and also a word like Simba, which means lion, is also a Swahili word. So, it's also an official language in the African Union. And it's also taught in more than 50 universities in the US and also in other universities in Europe and Asia. Next. This is our national flag. As you can see, it has four colors. There's green, there's yellow, black, and blue. So each color has its meaning. So I'm going to explain and give you um, a snapshot of my country based on these colors. Next. So green represents the land. As you can see, uh, uh, our country is uh, rich in natural vegetation and also agricultural resources. Uh, we have a total of 22 national parks and 32 game reserves. The most famous one is uh, um, Kilimanjaro National Park, which is also a home to Mount Kilimanjaro, the tallest mountain in Africa, and also the largest freestanding volcanic mass in the world. And also the Serengeti National Park is also famous because it has the largest number of uh, lions in Africa. And also it's also famous because of the largest migration which involves the movement of 1.8 million wild beasts, 500,000 zebras and 200,000 antelopes. So these are some list of the, some of the national parks which are found in my country. Next. Yes, this is Mount Kilimanjaro, and this is the Kilimanjaro National Park. Next. Yes, this is our national animal, the giraffe. This is the highest point in Africa. This is also giraffe, yes. Yeah, the more, yes, yes. These are some photos of the animals that are found in various national parks in our country. This is a picture that shows the greatest migration. Oh. Also, the Serengeti National Park and Manyara National Park is a home to mountain climbing lions. Now imagine uh, you met a lion and you run to climb a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Our lions will follow you <laughs> to the tree. <laughs> but don't worry, they can only climb the slanted trees only. Then we go to black. Black represents the people. So it represents the Swahili people, as we speak the Swahili language, people call us the Swahili people. So, sorry, um, we have uh, more than 120 tribes in Tanzania, but the most famous one is uh, the Maasai tribe. I think most people have seen the Maasai tribe. Um, can you go to the next one? Yes, these are the Maasai tribe. Next, yes. Yes, these are the Maasai people. And the Maasai people are famous because they are known to be bold. There are some stories that talk about the Maasai people that they used to fight lions. Yes, and also they live in near the game reserves and the national parks so that they are famous for that. Then blue represents the water bodies and the water resources, fishing industry and the aquatic biodiversity of Tanzania, as well as the importance of the water sustenance and the livelihoods. So Tanzania has a lot of lakes, rivers, and also we have the Indian Ocean. So I'm set with uh, Lake Victoria. This is the biggest lake uh, in Africa. The largest uh, freshwater lake, I mean. So, can you go back again? Yes, it is shared with uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. This is Lake Victoria. Then we go to Lake Tanganyika. So Lake Tanganyika is the second oldest and second deepest freshwater lake in the world. So it is known for its crystal clear waters and its unique biodiversity. This is Lake Tanganyika. Next. Yes. Then we have the Indian coastline, which where Zanzibar also is found. The Zanzibar Island and other islands like Mafia. Yes, as you can see, we have the most beautiful beaches in Africa. <laughs> yes, this is Zanzibar and Mafia Islands. 
Yes. It's so beautiful, right? Can you go back? Also, this is Stone Town in Zanzibar. It has the Zanzibar was colonized by Portuguese, but later was colonized by the Arabs, the Sultan of Oman. So they have this uh, uh, Arabic architecture. So they have this town, which is an old town called Arabic uh, Stone Town. So it's very beautiful town. You should visit. Uh, which Next. part? Which part of Tanzania this place? This. Yeah. This is Zanzibar. Yes. Very beautiful. It's very beautiful. <laughs> yeah, this uh, uh, well, during the Arab during the colonialism, they were Arab. The Sultan of Oman colonized uh, Zanzibar. So then yellow. <laughs> so yellow stands for the mineral resources which are found in uh, Tanzania. We are very rich in minerals such as gold, and there's also Tanzanite. We are the only source of Tanzanite in the world. Like Tanzanite is only produced in Tanzania only, which is a gemstone. This is Tanzanite. Next, this is gold. These are some other gemstones which are produced by Tanzania. So I welcome you all to Tanzania. <laughs> Uh, next, we are going to call uh, Sri Lanka representative. Our own martial art called Angapura. 
Sri Lankan giant squirrel is the national animal, and the national uh, national bird is Ceylon jungle fold. Now tree or the Ceylon ironwood is the national tree, and you can see these two animals only within Sri Lanka. So blue star water lily is the national flower, and we have three traditional dancing. They are Kandyan, Low Country, and Sakuragamu. Apart from that, because we have Tamil speaking Sinhali, uh, Sri Lankans, we have Bhartanatyam as well. So it's proud to say that the origin of cinnamon is from Sri Lanka, and we are uh, exporting many other spices. And even though it's a small country, um, we have we are taking the place of third within the countries that export in tea, as well as interestingly it is known as the Garden of Thames Lipton. Because we have the free education policy, Sri Lanka takes the highest place of literacy rate in South Asia and it approaches 92%. And you can see many rare gems in Sri Lanka like ruby and anu. And you can see the oldest human plant, human planted tree in Sri Lanka, and it's a sacred tree which is called as Jayashri Mahabodhi. And this is the world first female prime minister from Sri Lanka. She is the Madam Sinimao Bandaranaika. So you may like to hear about Sri Lankan cuisines. So actually, it's a combination of from India, Arabic, Portuguese, Dutch, and many other cultures due to the colonization effects as well as it's one of the most healthiest and the prettiest food in the world. So you can see my country, if you'd like to visit my country, here we are in India. And that is Sri Lanka, it's only 90 minutes away from air, as well as you may have heard like, Sri Lanka is the fourth most tourist attractive destination in the world, and uh, Sri Lanka is very famous for her hospitality and courtesy within other worlds, other world countries. So, you can dive into my paradise. Okay. She's blessed with tropical climate, so throughout the day you can see a quite pleasant weather. So here are some of the places that you can visit in my country. The first one is Unarmatuna Beach. It is one of the most popular beaches among tourists. And you can engage with uh, water sports, water games, and you can experience nightlife as well as you can see live coral there. And if you are a wildlife flower, a wildlife explorer, you can visit the Ala National Park and you can witness how the jungle is providing a home to the wild animals. Columbus City is one of the urban areas and here you can see many more man-made things. Here you can see the port city which has been made with sea as well as that is the Lotus Tower. That's the tallest um, tower in South Asia and 90 tallest one in the world with rotating restaurants. And Trincomalee, if you visit Trincomalee, you can engage with Hindu culture and you can see one of the biggest natural harbors in the world. Adam's Peak is a mountain and it's, it's very famous for the footprint. Buddhist people believe it's a footprint of Buddha, Christian people believe it's a footprint of Adam, yeah. Muslim people believe, believe they, uh, it is belong to them likewise. So anyhow, all the four religions can be seen within the one place. Then Sikir is a fortress and it talks about the many innovations, many untold, unrevealed innovations of Sri Lankan people, as well as you can see gigantic paintings within the city area. You can see the way Ambulo is increasing the sky, as well as Dunghila is one of the waterfalls among many more waterfalls in Sri Lanka, and it's one of the highest waterfalls in Sri Lanka, and we are call it as uh, the bright fall because it falls like the bright swell. Apart from that, we are the other places that you can visit in my country. So as you can see, Sri Lanka is very much, very rich with natural as well as man-made products. So ladies and gentlemen, the, as, uh, the, these are the small things within many more things of my country that I wanted to share with you. Finally, I want to give you the message, we are all human beings in the end, despite our differences. Thank you.
I need your attention, please. Have patience. We have four more, and then we'll go for lunch. Uh, next, I would like to request uh, uh, Iswani the presentation to deliver the presentation. The kingdom of the king. Sorry, the kingdom of Iswani. What is inside the flag? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we'll start with the shield inside. Mm -hmm. The shield is uh, black and white. It represents black and white people because we are colonized by the Britain. Mm -hmm. um, so it represents black and white people living in harmony. And it's in a shield because it uh, represents protection. And then the blue color represents peace and stability. The yellow color, um, the one I've forgotten, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have forgotten it. But I left it in grade four. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. And then um, the red color represents the blood that was felt, what was shed by those people who were working during our colonization. There were people that, um, there was some kind of, you know, oppression during that time. So the red represents that blood that was shed by those people. That's our coat of arms. Please, I will tell you to continue. <laughs> And the other one is our coat of arms. Um, we have the elephant and the lion. The elephant represents the queen. It's the queen mother, not uh, the, the king's wife. Queen mother, the mother of the king. And then the lion represents the king. That, and then the whole coat of arms represents the king and the queen mother ruling together in peace. That's why they have the shield in the middle. We can continue. Okay, so the kingdom of Eswatini is formerly known as Swaziland. So you find that some people know uh, the name Swaziland. And then our state leader, we are a kingdom, so we are led by a king. And our current ruling king is uh, King Mswati III. Um, he's, he's ruling with uh, <coughs> Queen Mother and Fombi father. <laughs> I have some flu, so. All right, and our capital city, it's uh, Baban. It's found in the high field. I will show you in the map that will come. And our official languages, we have two official languages. Um, we have Swati, which is our native language, and then it's English language. And then our currency is the Swazili Langeni. And our government, we are in absolute monarchy. Actually, we are amongst the six uh, absolute monarchies in the world, and the only absolute monarchy in Africa. Yeah. And then we have a total population of 1.2 million. I have been hearing people talking about a lot of millions. I'm like, how do these people live? <laughs> are they like stepping on each other in the country? But yeah, okay, so um, Swazi, Eswatini is a landlocked country, 
which is located in uh, Southern Africa. It's bordered by Mozambique and uh, South Africa. Mozambique is actually found in the Northeast. And then the other part of uh, Swaziland are bordered by South Africa. And then it has uh, four administrative regions and four climatic regions. I told you, it's a small country, yes, but it has a lot of diversity, except for the language and the people we are. We have one tribe, which is Swazis. Um, the administrative regions, we have uh, the whole region, we have the Manzini region, we have the Shiselemi region, and Lubombo region. And our, they are actually different. Up there, that's the whole region, uh, I will explain the climate there. And there's the Manzini region in the middle, and Shiselemi region right at the bottom, and then on the side, Lubombo region. Those are administrative regions. And then climatic regions um, that are demarcated by their climatic conditions. Um, there's the high felt, there's the middle felt, there's the low felt, and there's the Lubombo plateau. Those are the climatic regions. The first one on my... We didn't write in. Right? Yeah. The first one on my right, that's the high felt and then followed by the middle felt, the low felt, and then the last one is the Lubombo Plateau. So, um, the climate today, it's a subtropical climate. It has wet, hot summers, uh, which begin in October to March, but they have shifted. Before it was September, we actually had spring day one September. Now, because of climate change, it's now October to March. And we have cold, very cold, dry winters that have frost. And you feel like crying. Uh, from April to September. And then um, the terrain, like the landscape of the country, it it's very mountainous and it has hills and it's moderately sloppy when going to the low field, I told you about the regions. As you go to the low field, you then have hills and it's moderately sloppy like that. Uh, but in the high fields, the, the, it's very, very mountainous actually. It has a lot of mountains, uh, tall grasses and tall trees with heavy rainfalls. And then the low field, as you go down, it has, it's hilly relatively flat actually and then it has short sweet grasses it's good for for agriculture but the controversy is that there is low rainfall so yeah um, and then the lowest point of the country is the great Lesotho <coughs> sorry it's the great Lesotho which is found in the Lubombo region but it starts way up, it goes down, down, down until the Lubombo region. It actually cuts through the whole country and gets into South Africa. Um, it's, at its lowest point, it's at uh, 21 meters, which is above sea level. And then the highest point is 1,862 meters above sea level. Can you continue? Yeah. So this are uh, the terrain of Eswatini. As you can see, the mountains, the first one, one to the top row, and the first one here, they are normally found, these are terrain found in the high fall. And then the third, the third one, the last one on my, uh, on my left, yeah, is found in the middle fell. I, I just didn't include the low fat, the low fat is um, it's usually dry. It's dry and hot. And then the uh, waterfalls, we have a lot of waterfalls, we just don't have the sea. Let's continue. And then our cities and recreational places, can you continue? Uh-huh. So we have different cities. This is our capital city, which is Mbaban. Uh, the first one, 
And then that Manzini, it's actually the biggest city we have, since it's a small country, you don't expect humongous cities. That's our capital city. We have a couple of others, uh, like Sangano, Ezulini, Stegi, yeah, to name a few, continue. And then our wildlife, um, we have different animals, actually, I didn't include them all. Uh, but I included the zebras, giraffes, and elephants. Continue. And then we have craft. Um, we have a, play, a marketplace where they make craft. Uh, it's Ezulini, it's one uh, town called Ezulini. That's where they make this craft and what I'm wearing. But this, you can find it almost the whole country because they disseminate it across the country. Let's continue. And then we are very big on agriculture. Actually, every home, like no matter the, the space that you have, you usually have space for just a garden at least. But we normally have like fields. We work in the fields so hard. I'm so happy that I'm here. I've had my break. So we have forest. Uh, we do forestry. It's done in the high field. Uh, sheep harvest. Um, husbandry and piggery, uh, dairy farming, we have marula, we make a good beer out of marula. And then maize growing, poultry, a lot of things actually. And we eat all kinds of meat except a dog and a cat. Can we continue? And then our culture, with our culture I just made a, a small video because if I can start talking, we are known for our culture. If I can start talking, I will take an hour. So, can you just play the video? So, this is the Bukalu ceremony. We do our cultural dance. It's attended by women, married women. This is Ikwala for men. Still Ikwala. And then this is Umtama, the big dance. This is our cultural dance. Yes, and this is our flag. During the red dance, and those cultural dances that I told you about, uh, the first one, the Bukan, uh, it just completed right now. It's usually between uh, January and uh, February, when the, ma uh, the marulas are ready. Then make the traditional beer. And then we have the... Um, What's this? The Inguala is done in December, and then we have the Red Dance for Girls is done in August. Yeah, that is about Swaziland. You are welcome to join us in Swaziland. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to call upon the uh, representative to present the uh, on this Vietnam and uh, I'm here now to uh, invite you to my country, Vietnam. Okay, next please. With my country, you can see the geography. The square of my country is uh, about 381 million square kilometers with the population in more than 90 million people and uh, the language, my language and also Vietnamese people we call Vietnamese Quit. with the uh, in my country the national uh, holiday it have a true important holiday it is the festival 
and um, in the independent day holiday. Independent day is holiday. We will do it in the no, February, in the uh, September second. Every day, uh, every month. No, sorry, every year. <laughs> Uh, the capital of Vietnam is the Hanoi, and the largest city in my country is uh, Ho Chi Minh City. And in my country, we have the uh, 53 ethnic group, and uh, have the 96% is king, king ethnic group. Next, please. With my country history, we have more 1,000 years colonized by Chinese and from 111 one become BC and uh, to 938 AC. In our time, we have many war with China. Yeah. In, uh, after that, we have the colonized by uh, France and US and after that all time we have the independent day we got the independence and freedom in the second no, no, September uh, 1945 next please in the location no, you can see Vietnam have, have the S size this is the no, country in the South East Asia Vietnam border with the Chinese in the north and Laos and Cambodia in the uh, west and in the east side we have the sea we border with the sea ocean in the line I uh, demand before the capital of Vietnam is in Hanoi and the largest city is Ho Chi Minh City next thing this is for Hanoi capital and Ho Chi Minh city. They now uh, have some beautiful place you can visit in Vietnam. This is Ha Long Bay, where we have the UNESCO recognized in Vietnam and Banna Hill. Maybe you have seen in some advertisement or some no, communication media. This is some kind of traditional food of Vietnam. Almost no, traditional food in Vietnam is non veg food. It has pho, cha, gom tam, nice food, and uh, bánh mì, bún đậu ngọc tôm. All of that we don't have um, the kind of language, no, don't have English um, name. So that we just call it bánh mì offer. In English or in the offer dictionary, we also call it like this. This is the traditional clothes of Vietnam. This is outside. Like I'm wearing now, this is kind of outside of Vietnam. Outside is the, the modernized Vietnam national garment consisting of a long and a split tonic grown over silk uh, and you can see it uh, have a long silk like that so we call it a long and it is the shirt for wearing so we call it out and uh, it have some kind of uh, outside it shirt at Nhật Bình or outer thân something like that next one one of the uh, traditional clothes of Vietnam is very famous it is non la it is type of Vietnamese head work usually uh, used to sell the face from sun or rain uh, non la is used in a uh, typical symbol of Vietnamese people non la is common name of many type of hats like, look like, like is and uh, but now it's mainly used for before that we using when we go come to the farming uh, for agriculture but now it is uh, recognized for no uh, travel it is like a symbol for traveling of vietnam 
Next, please. Cultural and festival of Vietnam. In Vietnam, we have the 30, uh, we have 45 uh, any group, so that we have many kinds of culture, very diversity. But uh, the most in Vietnam is the King Any Group, so that we have, uh, and with the King Any Group, we have the uh, cultural and the ancestor worship. With the ancestor worship, we will worship the ancestor in and in many festivals and many special days. And in that side slide, we have the Tet Festival. In Tet Festival, it, uh, uh, it is the Lunar New Year of Vietnam. It is different, it is the same day, but different with the Chinese New Year of China. And uh, actually, tomorrow is the Tet Festival of Vietnam. And uh, in Tet Festival, we have many uh, activities for making lucky for people. Yeah. We call that Lisi. Like that, we, uh, the, we will give bring the money in red pocket to uh, child or uh, for to child or children. And uh, it uh, look like it's the make a meaning that we give bring the lucky and uh, give the wishing for children. Like, uh, uh, like yeah. make the new year with the health and uh, more lucky, red lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have Sonia. It means the first people when you come to my home that you will make, uh, you will bring the new thing to my home in the new year. So we will choose the, uh, we will choose the people who will come to my home first time. And in that time, uh, if, uh, if you are the people uh, we fix with the owner, house owner, we will make the lucky for the owner and for whole year. Next. And we have some activity for the, the public activity like the Mulan is the, the live dance and fireworks. In the tent, we have the traditional food. It is, it is compulsory have in Vietnam uh, festival. It is bánh chưng and bánh tét or bánh dày. Uh, with bánh chưng and bánh tét, we making by sticky rice with veg inside or non-veg. By bean or some uh, uh, many kind of beans. Yes and uh, wrapping by dong, dong leaf but if we don't have dong, we can use banana leaf this is making uh, with bánh chín we making the square shape and uh, bánh tét we making the silent silent clean 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 cold shape with that we making as that uh, bánh chín is the uh, Perform for the square for the earth and bánh dày is square uh, with the round shape. It uh, perform for the sky. It making and uh, in the last day of uh, old year when we cooking uh, bánh chưng and bánh dày, we will sitting and tell to uh, children for the um, story of the country of the agriculture, of culture. Some kind of famous of Vietnam. First thing is the coffee. You can see that the coffee, uh, when you explain about uh, Vietnam, you need to know about the coffee. Coffee of Vietnam is, uh, have the highest coffee gel in the world, and the export uh, of coffee in Vietnam is always in top in over the world. Like that, we can now uh, with an average of six uh, of two point six tons 
of bin or robusta or 1.4 ton of bin for Arabica for is for for over Next, yeah. Please uh, uh, wind up your presentation within five minutes so the audience are getting tired. Uh, they are so hungry. Uh, next, I'd like to call upon uh, Zambia uh, representative to present the presentation. Good afternoon. I know we are so exhausted and tired, but just give me five minutes of the time. I'll be done soon. So, um, my name is Patrick Mbayamba. Uh, I come from Zambia. I'm a student at Mihajan College, studying BBA. So, most people, when they ask me where are you from, I tell them from Zambia. They're like, from Zambia! So, yeah, from Zambia. so next please. So, uh, Zambia is a small country. Zoom out. Zoom out. Yeah. So, this is the flag. Of course, uh, we can see the eagle. Then the green, red, black, and uh, orange. So, the eagle represents the freedom that we have and the sovereignty as the people of Zambia to solve our own problems and be able to have the capacity to run our economy because we were colonized by the Britain and we got our independence in 1964 and that uh, day was a uh, beginning journey for us. And then we have the red which represents the blood that was shed by those uh, forefathers who fought for us so we can have the independence. Then the black represents the black people of Zambia, of course, yeah, black. Then the orange represents the minerals that we have. Next. So uh, those who get confused when I tell you I come from Zambia, Zambia is not South Africa, okay? Zambia is not South Africa. Zambia is located uh, in the south central of Africa. So before you reach down of the Indian Ocean, as you go to South Africa, that's where Zambia is located. And then this is the this is the coat of arm that we have. The coat of arm, as you can see, uh, we can see the eagle there, the hoy, the pig a man and a woman, and then the zebra cross. So, the, 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 the hoi and the pig represents the, the hoi represents the agriculture sector that we have as our main uh, economy sector that we practice in Zambia. And then the, the hoi, I mean the pig represents the mining that we have. Then the zebra represents the wildlife that we have in Zambia. And the man and the woman represents the family ideology that we have. So government makes policies benefiting the family, not an individual. And then, as you can see, one Zambia, one nation. When you come to Zambia, it's a free land. We are able to accommodate you. We will make you feel at home because we are one people. For us, when we look at you, we don't look at you as an Indian, as a Vietnamese, or a Chinese, or Nigerian. We look at you as a human being. So you are free to, to come to Zambia. Next. So the main three uh, categories of economy are mining, agriculture, and tourism. Next. So as you can see, uh, just some few pictures. So that is a mining. We have the Kansanj mining, which is one of the uh, se uh, seventh largest mining of uh, copper in Africa. So located in the north uh, part of Zambia. And then we do have Victoria Falls. Uh, Victoria Falls is very famous. We do have a lot of people that come to Victoria Falls to come and watch it because this is the only force you find in the world that links two countries. So it links uh, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Zambia. So the force, the force is very nice and very beautiful. Then this is the ceremony uh, 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 practices that we do have. We have the Nchwana, we have the Ksefa Pangwena. So the Ksefa Pangwena, normally we do have. Um, 
you, these people are found in the south part of Zambia, where uh, the king, where he lives, when the place is flooded during rain seasons, he has to move from that place and go to the, uh, uh, to the highlands so that he can stay there until uh, the rain season is over. And then we do have the Ngoni dance. Uh, the Ngoni dance is done by the Mambo people, even the Ngoni is uh, a Mambo. So I was supposed to wear this attire. But of course, the airport it has got two regulations, too much regulations. It is thought is an animal clothing, so these things were banned. So of course, uh, you can join. Next. And then uh, you can see that is the copper. Zambia is known for copper. So when you see copper, most of the metals, the, the, the gadgets that you're using, if they have copper, just know that it's coming from Zambia because Zambia uh, produces a lot of copper. And then we do, can you just please zoom out? Okay. Uh, you can see the other stone there that is um, yeah, the emerald. So we do have a lot of uh, windows in my country. We do have gold, we have diamonds, we do have emeralds, we do have uh, aluminium. So those who are interested to come and visit my country, please, you can come and then you're allowed to invest, of course. And then, yeah, next. And then uh, that is the food that we have. So the first picture on my uh, left side is showing the marriage tradition. Of course, uh, good news to Indians, um, my fellow Indians, my good friends. For us, it's a vice versa. It's not a woman who gives you the, the bright thing. It's the man. So when you want to marry, as a man, you have to make sure that your pocket is full. Because you have to finance everything. <laughs> Yeah, you have to finance everything. So you're welcome to Zambia. And then we do have some traditional food. Uh, yeah, Fisashi, Chihuahua, we have the tilapia, the fish. Next. And then uh, this is, the, this is the, the man in the middle is the current president of Zambia, Mr. Hakainde Ichidema. Uh, then on the other side, sorry, we are unable to zoom out. Otherwise, the pictures are very clear. Then this is the, the, on my left side there on top is the parliament. Of course, we are colonized by the Britain, so even our parliament setup is the uh, Britain way. And then we do have uh, a lot of women who are running government offices. So this is about Zambia. So if you want to get more info, yeah, just come and see me, then I'll, I'll tell you about Zambia. So, yeah, most welcome. Thanks a lot. Uh, the next one, I'd like to call upon uh, Thailand representative to present the presentation. to have me here today. And it's my pleasure and honor to be here for representing my country, Thailand, for today. Uh, can you go back? Back, sir. Okay, Thailand officially known as the Kingdom of Thailand, and our king is uh, Vajirat Lungkorn, also known as uh, King Ramaten, and uh, our Prime Minister is uh, Setan Tawisi. Thailand shared uh, the border with the four nations, uh, Thai, 
So it's uh, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, and then Malaysia in the south. Also, Thailand, uh, Shem, Maritime border with Vietnam in the Gulf of Thailand to the south, with Indonesia and India on the Amanda Sea as well. Our capital is Bangkok and uh, Thailand located in south of India. And we speak uh, Thai and English is also widely spoken in the above areas and uh, tourist destination. As a Thai people, uh, we are Buddhism, so we have uh, so many temples in Thailand. So the most popular temple one is, uh, we call Wat Arun. And the second one gonna be uh, the Wat Prakya, which is uh, the Lord, which is um, the the area in the palace of our king. Which city? In Thailand. Ah, uh, Bangkok. Yeah. <laughs> Thai culture is rich and they were influenced by Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, traditional practice, and uh, Thai people are known for their hospitality and uh, respect for elder and strong center of communi communication. Next one. We also have uh, so many festivals in Thailand, but as I, uh, I would like to present for today, one is gonna be like a Tong festival, which is uh, we call the light festival. So it's quite popular in our country. And the second one is a sort of grand festival, which is we call a uh, water festival. So this festival is gonna be for uh, April. So as as uh, as we call Thai New Year. So I think it's it's similar as in India that we call Diwali something. Yeah. Okay, and this is uh, Muay Thai. Muay Thai, uh, so, so we call boxing. It's quite uh, the uh, sport national in our country. The elephant also popular in our country. It's uh, the, the animal, um, the national animal in our country. And we also have so many beaches. Uh, as the picture that you see up, uh, above there with the boat one, we call a uh, cement beach, and the below one with the mountain, that one we call a uh, Lipe Island. And we have a Thai cushion as well, and we have so, so many. Um, very, very nice food in our country that I would like to share with you today. And this is our, um, our popular dishes in Thailand. So this is uh, it's the fried noodle with a uh, with fried noodle with a scrawn eggs and then we probably add some meat as a, a trim, we call Pad Thai. And the second one is green curry, which is a uh, with the creamy and a little spicy, and the uh, red, this the third one is red curry, a little bit spicy, and the last one is the quite popular one, so we call it tom yam soup, which is uh, the the most. It depends on how you like spicy or not, but uh, most people from Thailand they eat spicy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The last one is uh, I'd like to request our uh, Tibet uh, representative to deliver the presentation.
So my Canada friends, when we ask what do you know about Tibet, what do you think? Okay, next. So, who is he? Yes, he is the spiritual leader of the great Fodin Dalai Lama. Next. So, when we say Tibet, many people know Tibet by, you know, few reasons. Because they know Dalai Lama, so they know Tibet. You know, so nobody knows where is Tibet. I mean, many people don't know where is Tibet. Even some of my Canadian people, uh, Tibet is there. Then they will say Ushanaga, Golden <laughs> Temple. They will be confused. So today I'm going to show where is Tibet exactly where it is. Yeah, yeah. Please. So Tibet is here. This is India. We have a neighbor country of Republic of China. We have Burma, Nepal, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, we all are neighbors. So if you see on the map, next time don't say, don't point that Tibet is in Kushanaga, which is in the <laughs> southern part of India. So Tibet is in near neighbor to the Nepal, China, India, and many other countries. Okay? Next slide. So Tibet is often known as the water tower of Asia. See? In Karnataka, if you don't have Kaveri River, you have no life tomorrow. Right? So somehow Tibet is called the water tower of whole Asia. You know, as part of the president gave a lecture, uh, gave a speech, in his speech he told about the water. Why we call it water tower of Asia? See, most of the most of the rivers are coming from flow from Tibet. Since the Tibet is surrounded by snow mountains, the all the rivers coming from Tibet. You see, Brahmaputra. It, it, it goes from Tibet to India to Bangladesh, Irrawaddy River to Myanmar, Yangtze River, Mekong River to Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. You know, even in Pakistan, sometimes Indus. Even the China is depending on our rivers, actually. You know? Okay, that's why we call it Water Tower of Asia. We are serving 1.2 you know, billion people, you know, in, in, in terms of water prices. Okay, next. Most of Tibet, you know, 99% of the Tibetans remember this date, uh, remember this year. 
Which year is this? 1959. Why, why, people, why people don't forget this year? This is not my birthday, but year. <laughs> but why people don't forget this year? Exactly, exactly. I love that. This is the year where we lost our country. Oh. Where Tibet was occupied, illegally occupied by China. You know, that is why 1959, it's written on our forehead. We never forget that. You know, but still, but still, we believe, we will, our day will come back soon. So next, it's like, after 1959, our country was annexed by China, and we came to our group for the, for, for the refuge. Who's our group? Who's our group? India. India and Tibet has been a long history of relation, you know. We have a very good relationship. That's why we came to India for a refugee, and we become refugees. We have 1.3 lakh Tibetan refugees in India and, and across the world. But 6 million Tibetans still remain in Tibet right now. Next slide. So that is why, that is why, after we came into exile, we formed our own government. There are so many refugees in, in the world. We are the, one of the most successful refugee community in the whole world. We established our government in exile in Dharamshala, which is a beautiful town. You, you must go in Himachal Pradesh. And Indian government is so generous to us. And that's why we have a settlement. We run like any other governments, democratically. You know? Next. This, the government in exile is called Central Tibetan Administration. Since India, we can't have uh, two governments in one country. That's why it's non unofficial we call this Tibetan government, you know. But in, in office we say Central Tibetan Administration. But you, you must know that this has the long back history to Tibet. Next. So what's the situation now? Why I never met my family for the last 20 years? You know, some of Tibetans never seen their, you know, families. And even from the kids, you know, to the monks, you know, they self immolate they burn themselves. So that, you know, international community will you know that what happening in Tibet. Politically, socially, economic marginal, economically, you know, environment destruction, everything is going. So right now we are under the Chinese oppression. And we are the least free country in the whole world, even, even below the North Korea and Syria. Next. So the must, in, in the last of my presentation, I just want to just go to that. His Holiness says that the world doesn't belong to the leaders. The world, the world belongs to whom? All humanity. That is what. That is why we believe the truth will come sooner. So now let the truth will always win. The truth, yes. you know. And when the day come, when the day come, our our, our freedom struggle will prevail. Our truth, Tibet truth, will prevail. And those who are supporting Tibet, they are not supporting Tibet. They are actually supporting the truth. You know, they are pro-justice. They are not anti-China. They are not pro-Tibet, pro-Tibetans. But they are a pro-justice. You know. That is why we believe that our day will come. Because we are Buddhists, we believe in impermanence. You know. We, our day will come somewhere. When our day comes, you all are welcome. And see you all in Tibet very soon. Thank you so much.
uh, theme. I thought there would be presentations on that, but yes, there were. Because all these concepts, harmony, I understand as, you know, the situation where people from different countries sat together and watched. Yeah, diversity is what we saw now. And I already told you when I started that uh, this program, yeah, this is a good beginning. I only hope you continue this uh, for each country, you know, have more uh, time dedicated and also invite students from the campus. You see, ever since I was in the International Center, what I've been saying is that no community should remain an isolated community. You see, you are all students of the University of Mysore and so there should be more interaction between you and students from India. So you should create more opportunities for our students. I don't say by our students, I include you. To quickly remind you, you know, the Yuva Dasara when they were happening. Because I even told the minister uh, that time, you should, you should have a slot for our international students because they are students of the University of Mysore. And I must remember Mr. G.T. Devegauda, who opened it up, spoke to the DC, and I don't know whether there are there is an opportunity for international students to perform in your Dasra now. But for a couple of years, yes, they were. Because I said they are all students of our university. And our students from different colleges and departments must get an opportunity to meet with them, see their programs and their culture. So I hope you take this forward. And that's all I'll say. It was really nice. And I'm especially happy to see Vietnam and Thailand because I'm on my way to those two countries. Wow. 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 Next week. And of course, the national parks of Kenya and Tanzania have always been my dream houses. And so someday, because I'm, I'm basically a forest person, so I'm very happy. One day. I'm hoping that <laughs> I'll be there. Thank you very much. All of your gifts from us. Yeah. yeah. So first, uh, uh, yeah. First, I would like to thank uh, uh, Indira, Professor Indira Ji, for doing this year. And please, uh, due to the honor, you have some, some gift from us. Excellent gift from us. Thank 
Kowalski. Zambia, Patrick Yomba Yamba. Yamba. to the MC for the to, uh, today from Tibet, Hedzi Belki, please.
Thank you everyone. And last but not the least, all the Indian Nazi students, please we have a group photo and lunch itself will be uh, at the department, one of the class in the